Hi guys, today I am joined by Michael Ginsberg, who is a Doctor of Engineering Science candidate at Columbia University. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. My first question is, what is a photovoltaic effect in solar photovo photovoltaics? Well, basically that's where the, you take the energy from the sun, which is uh, the small particles of sunlight we call photons, and those photons come into contact with certain types of materials and they dislodge uh, electrons. Uh, and so they, 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 they basically get those, um, those, those, those uh, interactions moving in the materials so that you produce electrons and then you can move those electrons in a circuit. So basically what we do is we take the energy from the sunlight and we produce electricity. Mm -hmm. And how are PV cells different from concentrated solar power? Yeah, well, concentrated solar power is typically um, thermal, which is concentrating the sunlight through mirrors onto one central location, and then that that and then you would what you would do is you would uh, use the heat energy just like you would with a steam turbine um, from fossil fuel to generate power. But with the solar photovoltaic effect, we can generate electricity directly from the sunlight. Mm -hmm. um, will we see more thin solar cells on top of cars? That's a good question. I think that while solar solar energy is going to become more, um, you know, we're going to see it all over the place. I don't know if we're going to see it on cars. I do think that there are some new technologies where we'll probably end up seeing it in the windows of buildings. So there's some really cool, some cool innovations that the U.S. government, the Department of Energy is working on, as, as well as others, where we can actually put a solar cell inside of a window. So we could actually see that in a car, but more, um, more so I think we're going to see that in buildings. Mm -hmm. And how does different chemicals such as indium, gallium, phosphide, indium, gal um, gallium, arsenide, and germanium affect PV cells? Yeah, so, so those compounds are actually um, what we call as semiconductors. And so there's different materials uh, absorb light at different, uh, in different ways. So if you remember from um, you know, your science class uh, about the electromagnetic spectrum, you know, we have visible light. And then we have um, ultraviolet light, and we can have infrared. And so uh, if you really look at that very closely, you'll find that certain uh, materials like gallium arsenide and, um, and uh, copper indium uh, would, would have uh, the ability to absorb a certain spectrum of the sun. And uh, that ability, uh, it generally, it, what it means is that it produces different amounts of energy based on whatever wavelength of sunlight that it is able to absorb. So um, not to jump ahead, but one of the reasons why we explore these different compounds is because we want to um, basically get as much of that sunlight that's coming to, to the materials or to the earth um, used for that photovoltaic effect. Some of, a lot of it is, is actually wasted. Mm -hmm. And what are multi-junction photovoltaic cells and how are they different from first or second generation PV cells? Yeah, well, uh, that's a great, great question and, and really a good follow-up from the, the last question. So you asked about why do we look at these different compounds and semiconductors. Essentially, um, what a multi-junction cell, all that means is that we stack layers of different materials on top of each other. Um, so for instance, we could have silicon. Silicon is the most common type of, um, of solar cell today, and that's made from sand. Um, and then on top of that, we could have, um, or, or in a stack with that, we could have you know, the gallium arsenide, or we could have uh, perovskite, so different types of materials. But the reason that we stack them together is just like I said before, because those materials all absorb different parts of the sun's wavelengths, so that when we stack them together, each one um, will capture whatever wavelength it can. And so uh, essentially it increases the efficiency or how much output you get 
for the sun's energy. Mm -hmm. So um, just as a frame of reference, silicon and uh, solar cells would, would give you about 20 to 25% efficiency. But if you could stack cells together, um, then you could achieve 50% plus efficiencies. And while there is an advantage of stacking it and getting better efficiency, isn't that more costly to use more? And also, are there new chemicals and materials that have um, the same efficiency and effectiveness but are not as costly? Yeah, that's absolutely a consideration. So the, the multi-junction cells are going to be definitely much more costly because you know, you're going to have to, to, to do special procedures to put them together, to manufacture, um, test them. And, uh, but, but on the other hand, you know, it's a trade-off. So if you look at NASA, um, NASA uses those multi-junction cells because they want to get the highest efficiency because they're going to rely on that solar power in outer space. Um, and so, so essentially, that's that's really a big part of the reason why why we do it. Um, in terms of the new solar cells, the biggest one that you probably will hear about if you start reading about it is called the perovskite solar cell. That's based on a certain chemistry that is easy to produce. Um, this it's a compound that it's based on a structure. It's called a crystal structure that comes from um, the Earth's crust. But the materials that we use can, can be different, um, can, can vary. And we can synthesize that or we can make that in the lab at a very low cost. So we're able to achieve pretty much the same efficiencies, around 20% in, um, with perovskite solar cells, but at a fraction of the cost. We could even 3D print these cells and make them flexible. Um, so to your question on could we put them on, on cars, potentially we could with these perovskite cells. Um, unfortunately, they haven't been commercialized yet because they're still working out some issues. Mm -hmm. um, also, when it comes to large PV scale solar installations, um, the big cost, the soft costs, and not the hardware costs, what are they and how do we lower the soft costs? Yeah, so uh, engineers and economists talk about hard costs and soft costs. So hard costs are typically, okay, those, the material. Um, and the, um, you know, the, the engineering. Uh, the, the soft costs are pretty much everything that is not the material or the, the um, associated uh, production of that, of that material. So we've actually reduced the cost of solar cells, right, dramatically over the last uh, 10, 20 years. But what we haven't reduced is what's called the soft costs. So the major things that we need to work on is, is permitting, um, perhaps not the most exciting thing, but what we need to figure out is how do we, um, how do we reduce the cost of, of getting uh, permission to put the, sol the solar on our roof? So, you know, you might not know, but when you have a house, uh, when you own a house someday, you'll, you'll know that whenever you put a, uh, an extension to your, to your house or, or redo something, you have to get a permit. So it's the same thing for solar. Um, and because it's a newer technology, a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of towns and, 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 uh, authorities don't, don't really have, uh, the right, uh, that they don't have an idea of how to, um, you know, of what the, how it works. And, and so anyway, it's going to take some time. The other part of that is, um, the other big soft cost is, is just, uh, reducing the time that it takes to design systems. So we've seen a lot of really cool software out there. Um, where we can, you know, I think you may have heard of uh, Google, um, Google Sun, Sunshot, where, or uh, Google Solar Roof, where you can basically just determine how much energy you could get based on your location. So tools like that are going to help us to, um, you know, to, to get to see more solar and to reduce the costs that are involved. Mm -hmm. um, how common are bifacial PV cells for large PV farms? Yeah, I've seen them becoming a lot more, um, more, more uh, prevalent. But I would say that they're still not tremendous. There's still not a lot of them. The reason is um, so. So just to back up, bifacial means that you will have bo on both sides um, the the solar semiconductor, like silicon, solar cells. Uh, but 
but what we can think about why they wouldn't be so attractive economically. Um, when the cost of solar was so high, uh, we didn't want to have, you know, the other side of this that wasn't facing the sun, um, not producing a lot of, of, of solar energy. So with bifacial solar cells, we also need to have trackers that can, um, that can track the sun during the day. So anyway, for large solar systems where you want to get every single amount of sun uh, light you can, they're, they're definitely um, somewhat attractive, but you have to look at, you know, the economics of, of your system. Mm -hmm. And why is battery storage so important when it comes to renewable energies? And what are you specifically working on to help um, advance the technology in that area? Yeah, great question. So, you know, everybody's talking today about, about energy storage. Uh, so battery storage is one, one of those major technologies. I would say um, that the reason that I'm focusing so much today on, on energy storage is because while I think that we're going to be able to, within the next 10 years, get to about to get to um, 50 to 100 percent renewable energy on the electrical grid, the, the trouble is um, we, we, we have this mismatch or we, we don't, we're not aligning um, the supply of that energy with the demand. So we call that intermittency. And I'm focusing my research um, as an, an analysis of uh, especially one type of technology. Uh, it's not a battery, actually. It's, a, um, it's an electrolyzer. So an electrolyzer is... Um, essentially, it's a device that takes uh, solar energy or, or any kind of electrical energy as an input. And then um, with some, it's more, more than I can get into now, but it, with, some, uh, with some process, it splits um, water and it produces hydrogen and oxygen. And as you know, hydrogen is a, is a fuel that can be used by a lot of, um, a lot of industries. So the idea is when we have too much solar energy on the, on the electrical grid so that we don't have enough demand to soak it up, instead of, you know, um, getting what's called curtailing or instead of just wasting it, we can, we can push that solar energy onto an electrolyzer and produce fuel that can be used by industries. And hydrogen is used by a lot of industries for things like heating, uh, production of chemicals, ammonia, fertilizer, um, and also for transportation fuel. So for, especially for heavy, uh, heavy duty trucks. So the other part of that, that I didn't talk about is batteries and batteries are going to have a big role as well in, in, in smoothening out the, the, the intermittency of renewable energy. Um, and I do think that especially with, uh, convention, uh, smaller cars, like the ones that you and I would be in mostly electric vehicles are going to be the future, probably more so than a hydrogen based, uh, fuel cell vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, what advancements are you seeing beyond lithium ion batteries? Um, in beyond the lithium ion batteries, uh, well, there's a lot of research that are uh, that's taking place on um, uh, flow batteries. So that's a vanadium redox reaction, but essentially what that means is it's um, it's it's a liquid based battery. Uh, and it's used for um, long-term storage. So you can get a really long-term amount of energy stored. You know, we're talking weeks or even seasonal. Typically, batteries don't do a good job of storing energy for more than, you know, a day or two. If you think about the lithium-ion battery in your, in your phone, um, you know, it's going to run, it's going to de be depleted after, after a day. I, I think lithium-ion, there's still a lot of research that needs to be done. Um, I, I followed, I followed uh, some of the work that's being done there. And um, one, you know, one of the main advantages of lithium ion is, is that it works really well with solar energy. Um, just, you know, in, in, in a brief, in a brief explanation, uh, unlike lead acid batteries, which you use, you know, which, which, which have historically been used with solar and you use um, in your car, lithium ion batteries um, can be depleted, depleted fully, um, meaning it's called the, you get to a zero depth of discharge. So it's, you use it all and it doesn't hurt the battery. So then we can recharge it. With lead acid batteries, it really starts to degrade the battery 
you get uh, corrosion on the, the, the terminals of the battery. Um, so anyhow, we need to, we need to um, do more research on lithium ion to lengthen its lifetime. And we also need to educate cities and communities on how lithium ion is becoming very, very safe. There's a type of lithium ion called lithium, lithium iron phosphate, which, um, which is much less likely to thermally degrade or to explode uh, uh, you know, at high temperatures. So in, in, in summary, what I'm trying to say is, you know, a lot of cities don't accept lithium ion in, in, in homes, surprisingly, um, because they have a fear of fire. We need to do some education. We need to, we need to get more data out there on the safety of these batteries. Mm -hmm. And are these new types of lithium ion batteries available for everyone? So you're going to see, um, you're going to see some, uh, lithium, yeah, lithium iron, iron, lithium iron phosphate is, uh, they call it life because the chemical symbol is L I F E, uh, life PO, P O phosphate. Uh, so that is available through what's called Sonnen, S O N N E N. It's a German, um, uh, German company and they make those types of lithium ion batteries. Uh, you probably also know about the Tesla home battery, the home wall, the, you know, pack, um, that is, I, I don't believe that's lithium iron phosphate, but yeah, you're, you're definitely, you definitely see different variations, but just, just to, you know, reiterate this New York city, um, which has, you know, million plus buildings does not allow lithium, lithium ion. Uh, it only allows lead acid, uh, batteries. So, so this is something that, um, to the point about permitting and soft costs, one of the ways that we get more solar out there is by reducing um, the barriers to getting batteries in your homes. Of course, we, we, we want to do this safely, but, um, but we also need to recognize that there are big barriers in place. Mm -hmm, yeah, I agree with you. And what is decentralized grid and how do homes contribute to the grid? Yeah, great question. So decentralized means... Uh, so the electrical grid for the last, you know, 100 years was you would have a central power plant like natural gas or coal, and then that, that electricity would, would, would be sent out, you know, for, for, through, through uh, you know, very, very far distances all the way to um, your home. Today, what we're seeing with rooftop solar is decentralized. It's just a, a, a fancy word for rooftop solar, uh, on-site generation, on-site energy that you produce yourself. And the way that it helps, that it can help with the electrical grid is by uh, when, you, when you have a solar energy system, you're still connected into the electrical grid. So think of it like, you know, your fingers and the central nervous system of your head, but the fingers can also give back to, um, to the central grid. So when you have too much energy, then you have more than you need for your house. You can, you can export that back to the uh, central grid when, you know, and, and they can accept it. They actually pay you for that sometimes. That's called net metering. Um, uh, and also there's some, there's some other services that the, um, it's called an inverter. It's a type of device that works with your solar cells that the inverters, we have very advanced inverters today that can actually, um, that can help to regulate uh, the different parameters of the grid, like the voltage, the frequency, these are services that the grid benefits from. Yeah. So, but it's not all good. It's not all easy for the grid because think about that they have to manage all these different incoming electrical power flows and, uh, and then redistribute them. So it puts some more stress on the grid at the same time. Yeah. And have we seen this new idea of decentralized grid um, contributing more around the world? More than in the U.S.? Yeah. Um, it's interesting. That's, that's an interesting question. I think that in certain parts of the world where there, there was no electrical grid, so if you look at parts of Africa and Asia, uh, for one example, you have what's called leapfrogging. Leapfrogging is you skip over one step that that we, you know, that, that, that was in the process of development. So instead of a centralized grid, we're going to, we actually have more of decentralized energy. 
that you're seeing in villages and in towns. Um, you'll also, you're also starting to see what's called microgrids, which I, in my book, I put that in a separate category of de then decentralized. Um, so those, those microgrids and community scale solar, uh, we're seeing very, uh, definitely take off in other parts of the world. And we're starting to see that here in the U S too, and especially in California and in New York. Um, so co-communities are being designed and also retrofitted or renovated in order to, um, be independent and isolate from the grid. So, and, and, and also connect back. So, um, to answer your question, I, I would say that, yeah, we're seeing decentralized systems, especially in developing parts of the world where we have the infrastructure of the electrical grid in place, like in Europe and in, in the U S we're, we're seeing more of these microgrids um, because it's, it's, it's a lot more simple for the essential utility to interact with a microgrid than it is with hundreds and hundreds of uh, rooftop solar systems. Yeah. And thinking into the future, do you think that we will need to, um, that we will be able to generate enough electricity from renewable energy to pretty much power the world in the future? Absolutely. A hundred percent. We, we, there's so much energy coming from the sun that, you know, in, in one day, I forget the, the, you know, the exact phrase, but there's so much energy coming from the sun. We could power our electrical system uh, in one day, probably for the whole year. The problem is that we haven't been able to capture all of that energy. Um, and, but even today with the existing technology, we're definitely going to get to hundred percent renewable energy. And in fact, many of the goals of in, in different States in our country, uh, have set us you know, on that path. The biggest problem, the biggest technical issue that we have today is the transmission of that energy and the storage of that energy. Mm -hmm. And so that's why that's, that's a big, my big focus now is on, on storing uh, that energy and, and getting it out of the electrical sector. So there's a whole lot of um, other things that we have to be worried about, not just um, making our electrical energy renewable, but there's, there's heating. There's a whole um, a whole other part of our of our energy of our economy that is relying on carbon based fuel, and so we need to displace that with renewable energy at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like you were saying earlier, that eventually in the future, humankind will be able to reach one hundred percent renewable energy, but how can we achieve that? Is that by using our resources better or would that be like having a huge mass scale um, capturing device like the Dyson sphere? So um, yeah, the question of carbon capture is, is a good one. And I think that the, um, I think that those technologies are going to play a, an important role in, in our, in our, on our journey to, um, you know, getting to net zero carbon. I think, uh, you know, the sad truth is I remember I was, when I, when I started in my work, I, I did an internship at the Environmental Protection Agency, and we were talking about carbon capture all the way back in the early 2000s. Um, so the technologies have been around, they're getting better, we're getting at lower cost. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, do, doing carbon capture is also sort of recognizing that we've essentially failed to um, transform our energy system within the allotted time. And, you know, your generation and, and mine we're, we'll have to, to make these changes. I, I, and I remember back, back, back then in early 2000s when the, the term geoengineering and geosequestration or taking that CO2 and putting it into the ground was essentially a, a bad word. But today I think we're going to have to look at these solutions. So one, uh, one particular technology that I, I'm um, excited about, I was uh, involved a little bit in this research, was to capture the carbon dioxide off of a power plant and then to reuse that CO2 in, in, in producing more natural gas. So it's sort of a, a closed loop. Um, and, and instead of emitting that CO2, we can actually reuse it. So we need to think of innovative ways to take carbon out of the atmosphere um, at cost that is, you know, not too excessive. 
Um, and unfortunately, because of this urgency, you know, within the next 10, 20 years to, to, to stave off that irreversible climate change, we do need to look at these solutions. Mm-hmm. And do you think that renewable energy will be one of the main solutions in solving a lot of the issues in the world now? Or are there um, different other types of main categories that could also help? Oh uh, yeah, I think I think renewable energy is is one tool for for the problems that we have. You know, in some ways, renewable energy does not help with economic inequality, and that's why there needs to be a big focus on you know the social aspect of energy. So, as an example, historically, solar energy has been very expensive, and that also means that that it's been what's called a luxury good. So so that's what economists say is something that's only a few people can afford. So we need to make solar more affordable and equitable for, for the lower uh, income. And I, yeah, I mean, backing up, I, I, I have a lot of um, interests and I think there, you know, there's a lot of issues in the world that, that, are, that won't be addressed just by renewable energy. Um, I, I guess my, my focus in my chosen path has been looking at how do we make our planet more sustainable so that we can, live on it. Um, and also by addressing climate change, um, we are helping the most disadvantaged because the impacts of climate change will disproportionately impact those who are, um, you know, who are most um, vulnerable. So what that means is people in low-lying areas and developing worlds, well, they're going to lose their entire cities and their entire livelihoods. Whereas us in the developed world, will have the ability to to build and to adapt to whatever change what changes come our way um so anyhow that's kind of my my approach but yeah i started out actually more think uh, as researching about human rights uh back in the day <laughs> well thank you so much for spending your time to help educate all of us and it was really helpful again i've been joined by michael ginsburg who is the who is a Doctor of Engineering Science Candidate at Columbia University. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, Christian. And, and- <laughs>